guys, Andrea Mills here. Thank you guys so much for coming over and visiting with me today. We are going to do a Q&A video on um, questions that you all had for me about financial things and raising eight kids on one income. So, so I went through the comments and questions on the videos and I wrote them all down on my note cards here so that I can um, go through these with you. And this is probably going to be kind of long. I'm sure it will be. It'll be very long. So right here on your screen is an index of all the questions that I'm going to answer and at what point they are in the video. That way if you don't want to watch the entire thing you know what's coming up and you can skip ahead to whatever it is that you want to hear about. Earlier this month, I did a video showing how we budget and showing you the numbers for our family. If you haven't seen that video, there will be a link here at the end of this video for that one. Um, and I wanted to start with that thought in mind because um, I think, I don't know if people were surprised about how much money we have or I don't know. I feel like we have just enough to take care of our family so whether you think that we make a lot or not a lot based on what you expected compared to what um, it's supposed to take to raise a family as large as ours we make less than we should quite a bit less than you know what would be what's supposed to be necessary where we live um, so that might be very a very different number where you live because obviously different places in the country or around the world are going to have different prices for things so what it takes to live in one city or one area is going to be very different than what it takes to live somewhere else so that's why it's kind of hard to compare your um, finances with somebody else's because it's it's not it doesn't work that way. The first question, or so this one is actually not a question, it's just a comment that someone made and it really um, was, it was like the hardest one for me I think because it's the opposite of what I hope to encourage people but someone said after seeing, um, after seeing your budget I don't think I can afford a big family and that makes me sad because I hope to encourage everyone that you can afford a big family so don't let my numbers matter at all to you on that topic so to get started I thought that it might be helpful if I gave some of the background our financial story so that you can know where we started and how we got where we are Tom and I met in 1999 in January and we got married in July of the same year so when we were engaged and we were going to get married, I remember vividly sitting on his bed at his house. He lived at home with his parents and we were talking about how we were going to provide for ourselves once we got married. Um, so because at that time I was living with my aunt and uncle and we were both working but not making a lot and he was living with his parents. So neither one of us was living at that point. Um, supporting ourselves completely. So we start looking at our numbers and it came down to that between the two of us we were making $1,200 a month and that seemed like that's not gonna work to live on. We ended up buying the house that we live in still uh, in June of that year. We didn't live in it until about September because we weren't married of course and then even once we got married the house was so run down <laughs> that we had a lot of work to do on it before we could actually move in. I thought this is the part that feels fuzzy to me. I can't remember I can't remember when Tom switched jobs. So when we got married he worked at Arby's. He was actually going to school part time and then he was working at Arby's and I was working at the Christian school that I um, graduated from. I had come back and was actually, let's see, I had come, I had been living somewhere else and then I came back in December right before I met Tom. Um, actually that's how we met was because his dad was taking over being pastor of the church and um, I was taking over running the school so we met there at church. Anyway, so I was working in the school and part of my pay was actually living with my aunt and uncle because they were kind of the people who ran the church and instead of paying me, you know, a 
cash. <laughs> they just let me live with them so I didn't have to have rent or anything like that. I just had to pay like for my gas and whatever food that I wanted that wasn't part of the regular family meals and um, you know just whatever stuff that I wanted. Anyway so at some point after we got married it was pretty soon like I want to say within a month or two after <laughs> Yeah, I think it was that. Anyways, Tom got a job at a furniture store. I'll just, it doesn't matter when. <laughs> he got a job at a furniture store. And at that job, he worked on commission. So he made more money, but it wasn't always, um, it wasn't like always the same amount. We couldn't depend on like a particular amount every month. But he was good at his job and he, he ended up becoming assistant manager. I think he worked there till... He worked there for about three years, I think, because I was pregnant with Asher, I think, when we left, when he stopped working there. So he, I think it was about three years that he worked there, maybe four. And at one point, even though things were better, I had like no clue what I was doing as far as, you know, organizing my finances and taking care of bills and things like that. So I had a big learning curve, which I've kind of shared before about just learning how to keep track of everything and um, pay stuff on time and all those kinds of things but I got the hang of it I got systems in place and everything was fine then at some point during that job they switched how they paid us so for about two months we had like no money and that was a really hard time for us because even though I had figured out how to pay bills we didn't really have a lot of money in savings ever so that was like I remember once we had three hundred dollars and we were like woo you know we have three hundred dollars in our savings account and that seemed like a really exciting thing so those um, during those couple of months I I read so much stuff that I had bought from Walmart that I had not used so I just like returned tons of stuff and that's how I bought groceries for two months was just all the returns everything I could scrounge up that still was new in a package I returned it to Walmart and Tom's still bitter because I returned something that he wanted <laughs> and he teases me about it sometimes but that got us through and I also sold a lot of stuff um, in some secondhand stores I didn't really do yard sales but I did take in as much as I could to get money um, that way so that's kind of how we made it through that stretch then at some point the school where we were working or where I was working um, I had once I had Thomas I didn't want to work at all anymore I just wanted to stay home but they were having trouble finding anyone else to take over my job and so I ended up job sharing for a year so um, I only had to work a couple days a week and I could take Thomas with me which was nice after that they started thinking that maybe they would like to hire a couple to run the school so I still have the note where we were sitting in church when they mentioned this and I said to Tom what do you want to go into the education business I wrote him this whole note because you know that seemed perfect to me and he was like what are you talking about because he liked his job well enough at the furniture place and it just is not something he'd ever considered but he ended up quitting his job there at the furniture store and we um, took over running the school together. We got $2,000 a month, I think, from the school or from the church. I mean, it's all one thing. And then we also got $1,000 a month from a trust fund because Tom was still going to school and his grandparents, when they had, you know, when they passed away, they had left uh, money in a trust fund to help pay for his, their all the grandkids' school, and their um, part of that was like for their dorms and things like that. But since we were already married and he didn't live in that situation, they just sent us a thousand dollars a month to help pay for our living expenses. So that's how we went. We lived on that three thousand dollars a month for a couple, I think, two years. And by then I was pregnant with our third child and at that point actually during a couple of years those two years and a little previous we had started having some issues with 
teachings that were happening in the church that we just really didn't agree with. And it was a really hard situation. As I said, my aunt and uncle ran the church and much of our family went there. But we ended up deciding to leave the church, which was n not an easy decision at all for us. It was a very difficult decision. And I remember having a meeting with my aunt and uncle on a Thursday and telling them that we were going to leave the church. And it was very emotional. It was a very, very difficult, awful day. And um, they said that we wouldn't be able to work at the school anymore. And the next day, my mom and I were going to go shopping. And when I say like shopping, we we're going to go to the mall. But where we live, the mall is a but that mall is 140 miles away. So it was a long drive there and a long drive home. And on the way home, my mom was asking me what we were going to do because we were not going to have any money. And I said, well, at least we still have the thousand dollars a month from the trust fund. So hopefully that would tide us over until we figured out what we were going to do. And the next day was Saturday. I got the mail that morning and there was a check from the trust fund and enclosed with a check was a letter that said this would be the last check. They decided that uh, they couldn't, they were cutting us, not us, everyone off at a certain amount and um, because Tom was going to school at that point online and his classes were more expensive than other people's classes were that you know we'd already eaten up all the money they decided they were gonna give us and that was totally fine it was just such a shock that it happened like right that day which then of course I know God is doing this on purpose he's teaching us things but it was like all of a sudden we had no idea what we were going to do and that was a very dif difficult time so this was um, in April of 2005 when that happened and our third baby was born a month later so I was super emotional I cried a lot during all of that time it was very hard so after that happened for the next couple of months we were praying about what to do and Tom went around and he applied for different jobs different places and he got offered a lot of jobs but Everything that he got offered just didn't seem right for us. One place was managing a convenience store, I remembered, but they had to sell pornography and I, you know, we both couldn't feel good about doing that. So he turned that down and some of the other ones were just that he was going to be gone all the time. So like the whole time that the kids would be awake, he would not be home ever. And I remember one day telling him I would rather be poor than have him gone all the time because when it comes down to it, we're a family and that comes before everything else. And so sacrificing one of the most important members of our family for the rest of us to have whatever it is, I, that just didn't, that doesn't sit right with me. Lots of people hassle us over why we don't buy a bigger house. And I think because then Tom would never be home because he'd have to work constantly to pay for it. And that's not all he is to us. He's not a paycheck. He's our dad. He's the father of this family and we want him here. We don't want a bigger house. When that happened and I said, you know, I'd rather be poor than have him gone all the time. And he agreed that that was being away from our kids all the time when they were conscious was not a good situation to get into. So before this had happened, like within the year prior to that, Tom had already a few times helped people around town with their computers because he was known as being the guy that knew stuff like that. That's what he was going to school for, although he feels like his degree wasn't necessarily beneficial to him. It was just his, his own love of computers and playing games and things that helped him learn a lot about how things work. So he'd already done this just to help people out a couple times when they couldn't figure something out. He had went and helped them and maybe they gave him 20 bucks or something like that. So we decided that we were going to just try that <laughs> and see what happened. And we had money because this happened in April is when we quit the church and this, it, we did finish out the school year. So we, he worked there through the end of May. Um, 
but in April was tax time. So we had got a, an income tax return that was like $5,000, I think, or 6,000, something like that. So all of that money was in our savings account. And what's interesting is we had got the money before this happened and we had intended to do a whole bunch of projects on the house that we wanted to do. And our intentions were so much there that we had actually driven 115 miles to where there was a big store that we could buy all the stuff at that we needed. And we were going to ha buy everything and then pay to have it hauled back to our house because we didn't have a way to bring stuff. We wanted to build a shed and uh, some other kind of bigger projects with it. And the day that we went there to Menards, um, we walked around and I remember just looking at things with Tom and we're just looking and I just didn't feel good about it and neither did he. We both had this like sense that we should not do this. So we drove home and we didn't spend any money. We we didn't do anything that we'd intended to do and it was you know we meant to that's it was a big trip to go do that but we didn't and after the fact we realized that was the holy spirit telling us don't spend that money because you're gonna need it because it was like a month later that we quit and we got the letter from the trust fund saying no more money and all of a sudden we had nothing and so that is the money we actually lived on for the first few months when he when tom started you know doing his own business and we had like we pinched pennies tightly and had no money so we couldn't afford for him to advertise <laughs> so we couldn't afford for him to drive around even so what we did was we printed up some flyers at home and then he walked around town every day and he went door to door and he went up to all the businesses and he talked to people and just let them know what we were doing and then he would come home and we would just hope that someone would call and slowly people start calling and he started getting work but it took a long time it started to pick up I don't I'm not sure how many months it took for it to pick up all I do know is that um, the first month that we ran out of money in our savings was the first month that he earned enough to pay our bills without the money in savings and this is something I shared with some of you already on in the comments on the other video but I remember one month sitting there paying the bills and I got all done paying everything and I had ten dollars left and I sat there and I cried because I thought how in the world am I gonna feed five people for a month on ten dollars and I really don't know how we did I don't remember how it just somehow it happened and a couple of times we got like a an anonymous letter with fifty dollars in it and I don't know there's just so many things that happened during that time that were such a blessing that made it one of the most amazing times of our life even though it was one of the most horrible times of our life at the same time just how God kept providing all these things every time we needed something somehow it would show up or we would figure out how to acquire it in a way that we never imagined possible and I wish I could remember some stories right off the top of my head but nothing is coming into my brain to share with you anyways for almost a year we lived on average on about twelve hundred dollars a month and I remember thinking when we first got married and we looked at our budget and thought there's no way we could live on twelve hundred dollars a month with two of us and then we did it with five of us since then we've just kept on doing what we're doing and we just we try to be people who do what is right not what is the most profitable thing and we give away a lot of time and a lot of services to people I can't tell you how many times Tom comes home and tells me you know that this she was just a little old lady she didn't know what she was doing and so he didn't charge her and I'm totally okay with that. I tell him all the time, whatever God puts on your heart to do, that's what you should do because he's the one that provides and that's what it really comes down to. It's in Matthew 6, uh, 25 and following. It says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them. 
are you not much more valuable than they? We're not going to worry about it. We're just going to work every day doing whatever God puts on our path to do and we'll let him worry about providing for us. And I always tell Tom that too, that he, Tom works, but God's the one that provides. And so it doesn't matter to me if he comes home and he has not charged someone. Maybe he's worked for six hours at all these different places and he comes home and he says, I only feel good about charging for two because of all these reasons. And I think, I don't care. That's fine. That's just how it is. We're okay with that. But during that difficult period, we I bought a sign and it cost $10, which was a lot of money to me then, but it I needed to see it every day and so I hung it up in the kitchen and it was just said give us this day our daily bread and I would always say it in my mind give us this day our daily job so I'd always just pray this at least one person would call every day so that Tom would have at least one job one customer that sign actually hung in our house until this past year when we tore out the wall between our kitchen and living room and it was hanging there now I don't I didn't hang it back up but I hope to get that back up though one of these days even now things are iffy at times you know on my budget video I told you what my target is for each category but sometimes some months we only have half the money that we need and so we have to make hard decisions about you know where where's the money gonna come from and that's one of the reasons I'm thankful for the way that we've learned to save because we have that to draw on when we have months where we don't have very much and you know we theoretically have enough money if all goes according to plan to go on a vacation every year but that doesn't actually happen because that's the first one to go when we don't have any money or we are running short in a month we just we use up our vacation fund to pay our bills and that's just the way it is now when it comes to stepping out in faith and having more children when you don't know like right now you don't feel like you have enough money for that you know like I said we had three kids and we were living on twelve hundred dollars a month yet we continued on and we had the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and the seventh and the eighth and now we live on more than twelve hundred dollars a month a lot more than that um, but the thing that struck me one day was that this whole thing about God providing what we need, all the little birds that are living out there that he cares about them and they don't do anything and he provides for them and that we are so much more valuable than those birds, then I had to realize that that applies not just to me but to my children too. So if God is going to give us a child. He's going to provide for it. It's not my responsibility to worry about that or to make a decision that I can't have a child because I can't afford it. What I really need to do is realize that God will provide for any children that he gives us because he says that he will and the evidence is that he does. I might need to change my view of what I need to fit the reality of the situation because I think a lot of times that's what it really means is I I won't be able to have all the things that the culture tells me I'm supposed to have for a child therefore I can't afford it and that's not the case that's never gonna be the case there is always enough which brings me then to the second question which is what is one thing you've learned about budgeting as your family has gotten bigger and that's what it is that there's always enough somehow there's always enough and when I think that there's not enough that's because I got too much that's really what it is I've got too much of something and so my thinking is getting skewed and I'm starting to see things the wrong way. Um, I actually just posted this on Facebook because I found this little card that I had made during you know some of this time and I had written on there it was kind of based on a quote by Ernest Hemingway but it said something like this is not the time to think about what I don't have. It's, think it's time to think about what I can do with what there is and that's totally how it is that there is always enough. There's always there's just always enough and the more kids we've had the more prosperous we've become and not just in the numbers but in the way we live because we don't want as much I guess because we feel happy and fulfilled with what we have and so there's always more plenty to spread around for anyone else that comes along so that's 
probably the biggest thing I've learned about budgeting is changing my understanding of what a need is and realizing there's always enough to meet everyone's needs. So the next question is, how did you start your business? And I guess I kind of shared that just now. Um, I will say that there are, you know, I'm assuming in every place, there's uh, like small business councils. So we looked those one of those places up in the yellow pages because, well, this was before we did a lot of stuff or so much stuff on the internet, but we looked it up and we found where they had an office and it was free to go in and they really we had one meeting with them but they pointed us in all the right directions they taught us um how to or where to go to get set up to do our sales tax and all those kinds of things and they talked to us about how much we were charging because they told us we were undercharging because people would take us seriously if we didn't charge enough money and so they just gave us a lot of advice like that and it was also a learning curve for us on keeping track of customers like what they paid and all those things of course it was slow in the beginning so that was a you know gave us plenty of time to learn all these skills that we didn't have and you know as time went on one of the things that we had to deal with was how we were going to deal with the ever more frequent customers coming to our house because at first it was not a big deal Tom just went to people and they called him and then he would go but then it started becoming where people wanted to come to us and a lot of times they wanted to just wait for their computers to be fixed and then take them home again and that became awkward because we have just this little house and I'd be like having school with the kids and there's like a stranger sitting there in the rocking chair while I'm trying to do school with the kids so when our basement was collapsing slowly over time and we were going to have to get it repaired, we decided to turn part of our basement into a separate business office with a separate entrance so that people could come and go without it being like right in where we we're living life. Um, and one of the best pieces of advice we got from someone during that time was to stay small as long as possible and we've taken that to heart because if we had opened a separate business in a different place, two things would have happened. One is it would have cost us infinitely more money because we would have to pay rent somewhere else, we'd have to pay electric bills somewhere else, um, we would have to pay a person to work there for us if Tom was gonna continue leaving and going to other homes and businesses to work. So there would just be so many more costs that would come with that sort of uh, setup that we couldn't justify it financially. Um, the other issue, which is the more important one to us, was that if we had a separate business from our home, Tom's point of you know, reference was gonna be somewhere else, meaning that when he has to stay up till two o'clock in the morning working on computers, which happens sometime, he would have to be doing that somewhere else besides home. and it's been a huge blessing to us to keep the business in our own house so that when we have those long nights I can hang out there with him and the boys can help him and he's just part of the family even though he's working he's still here and we're still with him so even though like on a normal work week he leaves uh, four days a week to go out on appointments but he still might be in and out during the day or maybe he'll just be gone half a day and then back in the office half a day but it's made our whole life revolve around this one place and we feel very connected and not scattered and as I said it's just saved us a fortune from not having to hire someone and pay all that a whole nother set of bills on top of what we already have to pay. I shared in the budget video how our older boys help Tom sometimes do work. Our oldest son helps customers in the office when Tom's out and then uh, several of our boys can help build computers with him. So someone wants to know um, why our girls didn't help with the family business and um, I just assumed that they didn't realize how young the girls were so our oldest daughter is only six and I do all the bookkeeping and um, so when I'm doing like sending out invoices and things to people sometimes 
I'll, Eden will come help me and she'll like put stamps on the envelopes and help me fold them and things. So they do help and they will help more as they get older. But just right now they're just not that old so they don't help that much. Do you make money off your YouTube channel? This has been something I've been asked quite a bit and the answer is no. I've never made a penny off of my YouTube channel. The point of this to me is to make friends with all of you and to be a help to you and an encouragement to you. And you know, we all live by different metaphors. And so how you think about something determines what choices you're going to make. And I know a lot of people see their YouTube channel as their business and they want to make money. And so that's how they're going to do it. And that's totally fine. I have nothing against that whatsoever. That's just not how I see it. I see the metaphor that I use when I think of my channel is this is my home and I'm inviting you all into my home and I want to build relationships with you. So how I view an ad being placed on one of my videos, I would feel the same way if like a vacuum cleaner salesman or somebody said, how about I'm going to stand outside your front door and when your friends come over, I'm going to try to sell them a vacuum cleaner. If I'm successful, or if they at least listen to my pitch, I will give you some money for that. And I would say, okay, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. You stand out there and you try to sell stuff to my friends when they come over. I wouldn't feel good about that at all. That makes me feel yucky. So I don't want to do that. Again, if I was viewing this as a business, maybe I would feel okay with it, but that's just not how I think of it. So I don't, I don't make money off of it. I am not opposed to having a business attached to this, but I would want to do it in a way that I felt like I was adding value to your life and you agreed to pay for it. I don't feel good about having a middleman that's the one that's actually doing something because like playing ads, you're not actually putting money out for what you value and I'm accepting money for something I don't value and so I just don't feel good about that. So I am hoping to work on things in the future that I might be able to do some ebooks or something like that that I could offer and then if you wanted to purchase one then I could make money that way but so far I have not had very much time. Even my blog is like really lame at this point but the day will come when I get to work on that and um, We'll see what happens. And again, I don't want to sound like I think there's anything wrong with anyone else playing ads. It's not that at all. I just, I just don't want to. Do you earn any additional income apart from the family business? No. Short answer, no. I don't. <laughs> I do. If I, if I really hustle, I still have another video. I want to talk more about that particular topic, but I have in the past done work like for people, um, I designed menus for some friends that had a little coffee shop and they paid for paid me for that and that's how I bought the um, armoire that we use for a coat closet and I have done small things like that but I don't have time. People are always telling me oh you should open an Etsy store and I'm like I don't know how people do it because I can't do it. I can't do it. I don't have time for it and as much as it would be nice I don't really feel like I need more money. I would love to be able to pay off my house. So if I could just like figure out how to make $25,000 to pay off my house and be done with it, that'd be great. But I just don't have time at this point to do any other money making things. How do you track your finances? Okay. And the next one is, is your savings all in one account and do your kids have savings accounts? So I brought something in here so I could show you. Um, how that works for us. I do not like doing anything fancy. I don't like doing anything over <laughs> overboard. I keep it simple. I estimate. But this is a printout from an Excel spreadsheet that I make. I made like back in 2012, I think, and I just keep adding new pages to it every year. And down the side, I'm sorry, the lighting is going to be terrible in here, but down the side, I list all of my budget categories. The next row I had to squeeze this to make it fit on this paper but this is my target price or amount that I want for each of those things and then for each month I just put in the number of what I actually paid for those things so that I can kind of see about how much we're spending on everything. 
So this line is in pink because that's an automatic withdrawal and I just want to remember that it's coming out. The rest of these things up here I write checks for and then that's the automatic withdrawal. So then the re rest of these categories are all things that go into savings. So I have them grayed out and we have to pay quarterly income taxes and I made those ones purple so just like a mental reminder to me that those are the months that I need to actually pay the money rather than into our savings. Those are months I need to write a check to the IRS. Then this page, now let, let me clarify here. This is, on this one I show how much I'm putting into that category that month. And you can see some months we don't have any, we don't have enough so there's nothing new going into it. Then I estimate how much we spent on that particular thing. So if we did home improvement projects or something, I'll think, oh, we spent about $300 doing that. So even though I'm showing that I'm putting 500 in, um, I'm also thinking to myself two or 300 came out. So I actually only add 200 to the account when I figure it out. So this one actually shows how much each of those categories actually has in it in the savings. So the home improvements category, you know, it's 2,500, then 3,000, but then we spent some. So even though I show that I added 500 in, I also took out a thousand. So that brings it back down to 2,500. I don't keep careful track. Then I estimate how much should actually be in there. And then at the bottom, I have my totals for how much should be in the savings account then. So I don't like shift money around constantly. I just figure this all out on paper. And then when I go to pay my bills, I make sure that my savings shows what I say that it should have in it. And then I make transfers between accounts to make that happen. So there's not actual money being transferred most of the time. It's just on paper. And then the whole amount is in one account at the bank. And um, I just figure it out all on here. Then down here, this is a separate savings account that we have for the kids. And just because I organized by color, I thought it'd be fun to color code them. So I have them all like color coded, but I add $5 a month to each of their accounts unless they add some themselves. So then I show how much they personally have in that account. So all that money is also in a single account. That's the total for the account, but then it's just on paper shows how much belongs to each one of the kids. Before I did this in Excel, I just did it in a notebook, the same exact way. I would just each month write down how much I spent on, you know, whatever bills and then my estimate for how much I should have in savings for each of my categories. And then I'd make sure it all matched with what was actually in there. The only difference with doing it on the computer is like it does the calculations for me to show me what my totals are. So it saves a little bit of time and I can you know, keep it all in a smaller space, but really there's no reason not to just do it in a notebook if that's what you wanted to do. I have tried in the past to be like a person that sits there and I write down all my receipts or I put all that stuff in and that is just not happening. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care that much. When I have needed to, I have you know, I take a calculator shopping with me. I'm going to talk more about that if I get time in an actual shopping video, but I, I just, I, that's just not my personality. I know there are certain personalities that really enjoy making sure they've got an account for every penny. That's just not me. So I don't track my spending. I don't really look at receipts or keep receipts. Um, I just generally categorize things and Call it good. Do you use cash or a debit card? I use cash and a debit card and a credit card, but I really don't use my debit card very much. In my budget, I shared with you, I have the credit card category, which on this last year, I had one category that said household spending and a separate one for credit, credit card. But I realized that that just doesn't fit with what I do, it just doesn't make sense. It's like having two categories when it's really one category. So I tend to, at the beginning of the month, when I pay the bills, we, we have two separate checking accounts that we had before we got married. We each had our own account. So we continue to have those same two accounts. 
and all of the money we get from our business goes into Tom's checking account and so when he needs to buy parts or whatever business he needs to attend to he always has money available for that then once a month I take out basically a paycheck and put it into the other account that I operate from so that I have money to pay the bills so I sit down and I pay the bills I write out all the checks and everything and then I go to the bank and I get some cash so that I have I get lots of one dollar bills and some fives and tens so that when I pay the kids for chores which we'll talk more about in a little bit but when I pay them I have some cash available for that and I just I like to have some cash for myself so I do get some cash just to have on hand um, throughout the month then I also pay out the credit card bill whatever that amount is but I prefer to use my credit card for a couple of reasons one is I do a lot of online shopping and as I just stated I'm not a person who likes to keep careful track so if I use my debit card when I do online shopping a lot of times what will happen is I like pre-order books or something will get back ordered or something like that and so I I look at my bank balance and I you know, like with Amazon everything gets billed when you when it ships and so I look at that and I might have had one order for two hundred dollars but it's built out in like 10 different orders with smaller amounts and I don't want to go back and figure out what's actually been billed and what hasn't and then try to figure out how much money I need to still keep in my account like what hasn't come out yet that's going to come out and it just is complicated and I don't enjoy that so I would prefer to use my credit card so that no matter what happens the the transaction will go through and it won't like overdraw our account accidentally or something like that so I that's my main reason for using a credit card the second reason is that we do get you know points on our credit card and we can get um, money for that so we used a, we cashed in all of our points when we we're gonna go on vacation this year and we ended up getting a check for like eighteen hundred dollars I think so it paid for a huge amount of our vacation which was really nice and so that's just like an added bonus we pay the credit card bill off every month so we never have to pay um, interest or anything like that on it how do you pay off credit card debt that's another good question um, there have been times in the past when I was still learning that we had more money on there that we could then we could pay off and obviously the big thing is to not use the credit card until you can pay it off I think of it as looking for every available source of income that you can to pay for it so I feel like you should be shameless about eating ramen noodles like every meal and not buying any new clothes or anything until and putting like everything you can towards the credit card and I have seen I've read stories about people who paid off humongous amounts of debt in like short amounts of time like this one person is like hundred and eighty thousand dollars in a year or something and I'm like that's like numbers I can't even comprehend but that's kind of their approach was like we will just eat nothing <laughs> until we get out of debt and I I'm not necessarily the person to give good advice on that but I know there are people like the um, Financial Peace University a lot of people really like that they kind of have like the snowball method so that all the different things that you owe on you just keep paying the minimum on each of them and the, whatever the smallest bill is that you have like let's say you owe five hundred dollars here and a thousand there and fifteen hundred here then any extra money you can you put toward the five hundred dollar one and once that's paid off then all the money you're paying for that each month add that to the payment that you're making on the second one until that one's paid off and it's gonna go a lot faster now because you're paying like twice as much toward it because you don't have this other bill now and it just gives you encouragement because you see you're making some progress so I think that's kind of the reasoning behind that method how much does it really cost to raise a child from birth to 16 I just was reading an article the other day that says I can't remember it was like 200 and something thousand dollars to raise a child and I just think that's comical to me for one thing when you see those numbers they're taking into account your house payment and I don't know what all a lot of things that you're gonna have no matter what you're doing in life so it's kind of sketchy how they come up with those numbers and the other thing is there's a huge difference even in their little chart between 
someone who lives on this with this income and someone who lives on this income this income is a lot less to raise a child which tells you that this number doesn't mean anything it means this is not how much it costs to raise a child this is how much people spend raising a child and you do not need to spend that much to raise a child um, as I mentioned in our budget video we at the moment our target budget would be six thousand dollars a month but sometimes we don't have that much and so we live on less so that's like six hundred dollars a month per person in our family uh, we could definitely we do get by on less than that a lot of times and there's things that we could do without we could easily tighten our belts more to live on significantly less than that so I don't know what it costs to raise a child from zero to sixteen because I've never kept track of those sorts of things but do not ever let those silly numbers scare you out of having a large family because it just it's ridiculous it it's not it's nothing to worry about do the kids have activities that you have to pay for no no that's pretty much no uh, <laughs> the um, we used to be very very involved in the Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts we are not anymore but we're just we just don't care like I know a lot of people are real into lots of activities and I'm not sure why if it's because they enjoy them or you feel like this cultural pressure that you're supposed to be well-rounded and do all these things so you do them but that's not us we don't feel that sort of pressure we just enjoy living our family life here keeping things simple and so we don't participate in sports and things like that that come with a lot of high cost and we're completely fine with that um, on Friday nights Tom does go out and he they play Magic the Gathering so that costs money when he goes to that which is fine he pays for his entry fee if any of the boys want to go they have to use their own money to pay for their entry fee which is like $15 a week how do you keep the kids from begging at the store I have a whole video that I've made on I, I think I called it how or our efforts raise financially responsible adults and the short answer is that we never buy them things when we go to the store so we start when they're little by giving them some money when we go shopping so right now Solomon and Sophia are three and four and they get a dollar and a quarter when we go on our weekly grocery store trip and they are free to spend that on whatever they can afford so they don't ever look at me as the source of what of their treats they have their money and they can choose whatever they actually have the money for and even if I had not started this with my kids which I have with all of them when they were little the same principle would still apply if you or your kids were much older you could do the same thing and whatever amount you feel comfortable spending give that to them ahead of time and tell them this is you know you're free to buy what you would like and but I'm not going to buy anything for you so I always say to them when we when they're little and they're still learning this concept and they want something I say did you bring any money and I of course also make sure that they always have a way to earn money so we pay them for their chores and we pay an amount that is comfortable for us it might be more than what other people might pay or less than somebody else might pay their kids but that's just what work what works for us and so when they're little they buy their own things with the money that we give them once they get about first grade they um, start doing chores we clock in I bought little cards at Office Depot like you like we'll punch time card things and when we're gonna do our daily chore session everyone writes down the time they start and we work on our chore list all together at the same time and then when they're done they clock out and they each earn an amount of money per minute based on how good of workers they are and we actually do evaluations from time to time and their pay might go up or down based on how they're doing but I when it's payday I add up all the minutes that they worked and it sounds more complicated than it is it doesn't take very long like 10 minutes it takes me to do this and so I add up their minutes multiply that by their wage and then I pay them that money and that's what they use then to go buy their treats or anything that they want um, then our son Thomas because he works in the store for us we pay him a dollar an hour to work in there which is like <laughs> he doesn't really have to do much he just helps customers when they come in and he sells things but mainly he just works 
in the office he does his schoolwork while he's in there so he just hangs out in Tom's office and does his schoolwork during the day and then if somebody comes in he helps them and Thomas also then we want them once they start earning more money like that to start we don't want them ever to think of their money as their own in the sense that it's not it's like all for my own selfish desires so we have Thomas buy all of our family's bread every week so that he has something outside of himself that he's required to give his money to and he has plenty so it's not a financial burden on him but we really want the kids to think in family terms when it comes to finances that when they are adults and they leave home their money is to meet their needs because we all have our own needs that we want you know we need met so there's nothing wrong with buying stuff for yourself but when you view your money as yours alone and you begrudge having to provide for someone else with it that's a problem so that's kind of how we do that so anyways this whole kind of learning process all the kids go through they never ask me for things when I take them shopping because it's just not something that they've ever done because I don't buy them things I always from the time they're about three or so they start shopping on their own and taking care of their own things and so they just that's how it is and as I said if I had not started this I would still do the same process with an older child I'd still go through the same thing like if they had were totally not used to this I would start giving them an amount of money when we went shopping and say this is how much you can spend and you know have at it I don't control what my kids buy so I you know let them if they want to waste all their money or whatever you want to call it I'm okay with that because I want them to learn now without me bossing them all the time about what to do I offer advice but if they make a decision that I think that was not very smart that's okay with me too because I'd rather them learn that now than when they leave home and I'm not there I mean and it's a big deal but then I would work toward that earning the money situation for them to earn their spending money and then you know carry on from there how do you save for college we we don't <laughs> the answer to like all these questions is no we don't we don't save for college um, I'm probably not going to address this whole thing here but college is not necessarily a dream that we have for our kids so you know if they decide to go that's fine but just like everything else they'll have to pay for it and like lots of people pay for their pay their own way through college and they do just fine so either they'll pay their way or they'll hopefully you know maybe they'll find some scholarships or something like that but it's not like a big concern for us to put money aside for college because it just isn't how do you save for retirement once again we don't we actually do have a 401k that Tom had from when he worked back at the furniture store but it's kind of silly like there's like hardly anything in it it wouldn't last very long we have a lot different views on a lot of things than a lot of people so when I hear numbers like you need this amount of money saved for retirement I just think that's not the life I want to live I don't want to live a life where like my whole goal in living is to try to set aside enough money so that I can stop working and then like I don't know what for a few years that just doesn't seem like a valuable goal to me and again God provides so I try to think of it in a completely different way and I I should say we not just me but how was this designed to work when God created humankind how did he design this process to happen and how I see it we spend our most productive years raising our children and caring for them and providing for them and hopefully we will be debt free so that when we reach old age we don't have a lot of bills to pay because we don't have debt and we have lots of children so that if for whatever reason we need financial help they will be there to help us it's not necessarily a goal of ours to just like stop working either that's not that's not our dream our dream isn't to like check out and do what we want our dream is to continue to provide valuable work to our family and to our community until we die and if that produces some income that would be great 
if it doesn't and we need some income then we have at this point eight people who will help provide some social security for us and we are not we have no illusions that you know the government social security is still going to be there that's like not even on our radar of possibilities so we just we teach this to our children too that this is how it works we spend our productive years caring for you and when it turns around then their productive years can help care for us if we need it and um i like the like the in the amish community i was i i don't really know i've never been in an amish community i just enjoy learning things i read books and things like that but they had a way how they did it was like there was a main house and then a little extra house and when the family that lived in the main house was aging and you know retiring they moved to the tiny house and let one of their children have the big house with their family in return then that family would help them in their old age and that's really the model that we want to live on is that our family is what we're pouring ourselves into and that's our retirement is your house insurance and property taxes part of your house payment this was on the budget video um, we spend five hundred and eighty five dollars a month is what our house payment is and that is included the insurance and our property taxes are part of that amount what do you do to give or tithe I'm gonna recommend for you to go watch our home church video because that will kind of go into that a little better I think it's been a long time since I made it so I can't remember but we view the money that we give to Samaritan Ministries as giving because well we're we're actually giving it to another family not to the ministry but how we see it and again this just watch that other video but what we have when someone else is in need we give to them and if we're ever in need they will give to us that's how this whole process works and um, so we view that as giving and that's almost one of our biggest monthly expenses we try to just be generous people when we know of something that someone needs and we have an opportunity to provide it we do that we're generous with our time Tom as I said already often does work for people that he doesn't charge them for obviously I spend a significant amount of time um, giving my time to you guys I don't I don't feel comfortable just like sitting here telling you well, we gave this amount to this person and this amount to that person because that's weird but I can just assure you that in a very in a private way the people that God brings into our lives we always try to just be giving and generous with and we don't keep track of that any more than we keep track of anything else I, I have no idea how much we actually give because I don't I don't keep those numbers on the topic of Samaritan Ministries that's the um, health insurance alternative that we participate in it says can anyone join Samaritan Ministries and it is a nationwide um, organization so anywhere in America I don't know if they operate outside of the United States but at least within the United States any every area is included um, and it also exempts you from any of the what is it the Affordable Health Care Act thing or whatever there are requirements to becoming a member though so every year we have to fill out a thing that talks about um, like do we attend church regularly and just things like that and we have to have a pastor sign it and because we're a home church it offers another alternative way of doing that so our friends that are part of our home church vouch for us and we vouch for them for Samaritan Ministries but it's a much more affordable way to go if you have a large family because we um, we pay $495 a month and when we looked at regular insurance it was a joke that was just not happening so on my budget video where's your grocery budget I didn't specifically mention a grocery line item on my budget because the credit card category is just basically all household spending so my groceries and my gas and you know giving birthdays all that kind of stuff all came from that so our target for every month is two thousand dollars for for all of that kind of spending but it may or may not actually be that amount I did do a couple of haul videos so that kind of gives me a better idea <laughs> but I just don't keep track so um, one of you was very kind to point out that I spent like 
$75 per person it, for like all of our Walmart stuff and the things I ordered on Amazon and then I spent $90 at the grocery store and that's a basic like $100 would be a good amount to say that we spend every week on groceries so whatever that calculates to that's what we spend <laughs> do you use coupons no seriously no is my answer to everything um i tried couponing once but we live in a place that does not have discount grocery stores i don't have a sam's club i don't have a costco all these is non-existent all of these wonderful places that i always see hauls for i could drive hours to get to one but it's just not how it is and even with couponing when i tried to do couponing i'm like how do people do this because there's just not like it was just I wasn't like finding all these great deals that everyone was finding and it took a lot of work and it didn't seem worth it to me maybe if I live somewhere else it might be or maybe I just didn't figure out how to do it right I don't know but I don't bother with coupons unless one like falls in my lap and I can use it I love coupon codes when I shop online I always look for those but even when I have a coupon I usually end up forgetting it even when I like take it to the store, I forget to use it when I actually pay. I, it's just does not, I'm, I don't do it. And again, I am hopefully going to have a video on some of my shopping habits that are still money saving without couponing and discount groceries. How often do you eat out and how much do you buy? For instance, when we go out for pizza or something, how many pizzas do we buy? We eat out generally once a month because we always let the kids pick where they would like to go for their birthday. So they get to go, go out somewhere for a birthday dinner. And since there are 10 of us, that comes out to being about once a month. Tom and I go out on a date night once a month. So we all eat out a little bit more. On my monthly shopping day, I usually get some lunch while I'm out, but not often, or not always. Um, but with the kids, we don't really have fast food in our town so we'd have to drive to get fast food it just costs a lot of money so we figured out how to make our own fast food at home and save ourselves some money when we do order pizza sometimes tom always makes pizza on thursdays for us but sometimes he's working late or something happens and we have to order it from the truck stop here so when that happens we get two pizzas and sometimes he gets it like from little caesar or something just for the fun but we always just get two pizzas and then we add stuff to it if that's not enough for everyone because it's really expensive. How do you have inexpensive family fun? Uh, that's something that I think again goes back to those metaphors that we all live by and some people live by the metaphor that extravagant and unusual is special and other people live by simple and sustainable is special and that's the category we have tried to fall into so we we just enjoy doing anything uh, we like going to the park and we don't make a big deal out of it if we can only go for half an hour we'll just load everybody up and we'll go to the park and have fun playing and then we come home and a lot of the stuff that we do is based on home events we have our family game night um, we like to play Pokemon Go together, so we'll go on walks together, and just simple things like that. That is just it, to to us. It's just about being together. It's not really what we're doing. It's just being together. So if we can be together for free, then that's great. How do you do inexpensive date nights? Um, we always go out to dinner on our date night. One of the things that we try to do is when we get gift cards for restaurants, we save those for date nights. So I have a little file thing and they're all filed in there and so sometimes we'll say well where do we want to go tonight and we'll look through the gift cards we have and use one of them and go to that restaurant and have a free dinner um, if we don't have a gift card for some place we want to eat then we just go eat there we don't make a big thing out of it but we don't we used to go to the movies but I don't know it was just expensive and we just didn't care that much so we don't really do that anymore <laughs> this last month we went shopping at Albertsons because I needed some vodka to make some medicinal tinctures and I always feel awkward a little bit buying it and Albertsons has a little liquor store that's attached to it that doesn't feel weird to me to go into. 
totally. So we went there and got the vodka and while we were there we just walked up and down all the aisles and we visited and we looked at things and we brought home some weird random stuff that we saw and like one of the things was squid ink spaghetti. It was like black spaghetti and that was so weird so we brought that home and we're going to cook it and have it with the kids. Sometimes we'll go for a walk or Um, sometimes we'll go out to dinner and then we come home and we watch a movie together at home. Sometimes if for whatever reason we can't get away, we'll just stay up after all the kids are in bed and I'll make a nice dinner and I'll get out the nice dishes and, um, we'll have a di like dinner together like that or we'll sit out on the porch swing and just visit and look at the stars and be together because really that's, that's what we care about. How do you save money when you travel? we don't do it very much so then it doesn't cost very much we just we just save ahead what well, I guess one of the biggest things is that if we have to get a hotel we definitely don't fit in a single hotel room anymore so we always have to get two hotel rooms so it's really nice if we can go to a residence inn or something like that where um, we pay one price for a room that has bedrooms like we've stayed in them that have like two bedrooms and two bathrooms and a kitchen and a living room and we spent like hundred and sixty dollars a night or something like that so it was cheaper than buying two regular rooms and it meant we were all together because we had the two bedrooms and then the living room had like a fold-out couch to sleep on so everyone had plenty of room to sleep and then we were able to cook food right there in our hotel room which was really nice so we just could get groceries and then um, cook our own food so that saved money. When we went to Kentucky a few years ago we took the kids to the Creation Museum there and we got a room like that. I think we only paid like 115 for that room and it wasn't as big it was just like a sort of like a regular hotel room but it also had a kitchen and that was really nice and we didn't eat out on that trip the whole time except for on the drive there and on the drive home. Um, so that saved us a lot of money because the room itself was not that much and then cooking our own food was just very inexpensive. Oh wait, no, I'm lying because <clears throat> it was my birthday while we were there. So I think we might have went out for a birthday dinner. Um, <clears throat> also on that trip we got like a an annual pass to the Creation Museum, an annual family pass because it was cheaper to do that than it was to buy a couple of day passes. So the annual pass was more expensive than a day pass, but we were able to go several days or whatever without having to pay more money. So that was something that saved us some money. I don't know if that helps, but how do you budget for birthday parties? Um, the, the birthday budget is part of our $2,000 target for spending every month. Um, we only do big parties up through the age of 12. After that, we just go out to dinner and we buy them gifts, but we don't like actually plan a party. So how I do it is the kids tell me what theme they want for their party. And sometimes they come up with things I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to do that, but they tell me what they want their theme to be. And then I start thinking about activities that we can do and I maybe look online and see if other people have done something and get some ideas. And I'm looking for things that I can manage to do and that aren't going to cost us a fortune. Because again, we live by the metaphor, simple, sustainable, is special. So we don't go all out. We don't start going all out on a first birthday because if you do it then, you know, starting young, you just have to keep building and building and it just gets bigger and bigger and more expensive every year. So if you can start out keeping it simple, it'll be much easier as you go along. But the kids will tell me their theme. I come up with a few activities. I usually aim for three activities. And then I like to shop at Oriental Trading um, and then I'll shop on Amazon for things. And I just start looking for things that might work for the party, for goodie bags, and for the activities that we have planned, and um, start putting them in my cart. And I, when I get close to a hundred dollars, I think, okay, time to shut it down now. And even I, you know, would be happy with less than that too. So I don't, I don't try to spend that much. It's just, that's like when I put the brakes on, no more. 
and maybe put some things back or figure out some different things to make it work. I make a lot of stuff myself like just printing out things that will fit our theme and then I have a lot of reusable stuff so I don't have to buy everything over every time so if you've watched very many of our birthday videos you may have noticed the felt birthday banner that's hanging up. I bought that at Hobby Lobby years ago for like seven dollars and we use it every birthday. Um, I made my own tablecloths that are festive from fabric that I bought and I just had to buy new fabric because now that we have this bigger table um, our old tablecloths didn't fit anymore so it was not cheap <laughs> to buy fabric to make a tablecloth. I think it was like fifty dollars or something for two different fabrics but we will get a lot of use out of it so I uh, just reusing things then when it comes to gifts I have kind of the same limit like a hundred dollars or way under a hundred dollars is good with me um, for our older boys who don't have parties anymore I am willing to spend more on their gifts because we're not paying for a party I think all of it is just like to stop thinking so huge and like you see so many things that look so amazing and you want to do it all and you can't it's just silliness and it's just for one day and the kids are going to love it no matter what you do it's still going to be their special day and it's going to be just as special spending a hundred dollars as it is spending five hundred dollars so when you like start thinking about that that like let's think about them and making them feel special but not making them feel that specialness is comes with lots of things and money then you'll figure out how to make an inexpensive party that still seems really fun and special. I think this would be a good topic for another video like giving more details so I might do that. How do you save money on baby items? I think with everything like with experience you learn that like there's like a whole lot of stuff out there that you could have but you really don't need. So mainly it's just not buying very much. I, my friend is having her first baby like any day. I think it was her due date yesterday or today and I'm, that's why I told her like don't buy anything unless you really know that you need it because it's so easy to just buy everything and then you have all the stuff and especially with a small house. That's one of the blessings of a small house is you can't do that because there's no place to put it. But obviously there's the obvious things like the baby needs a car seat and a place to sleep but even that you can get by with we have a Moses basket that our babies sleep in unless they're sleeping with us on our bed for at least five or six months before you need a crib but um, when they're when they first are when we have newborns I make sure they have about four pajama things and four undershirts and a couple of packages of diapers a package of socks and a few grooming things like um, some bath wash stuff and uh, a hairbrush is really great like those baby ones for scrubbing their little scalps and things like that and then nasal aspirator in case you gotta get little boogers out of their noses wipes and diapers I think I already said diapers <laughs> but you really can get by with an extremely small amount of stuff and you'll be much happier if you only go out and buy something when you actually have the need for it because I know for me I was like trying to plan ahead and then I end up with all this stuff that I didn't actually need or use and I just you'd be much better off to wait until you actually have the need and then go buy it because then you know you actually need it also I don't buy name brand um, not that there's anything wrong with it I don't buy name brand like diapers and things I have always bought the cheapest ones at Walmart and they work just fine so I think that saved us a lot of money. How do you keep up with decorating trends on a budget? I love decorating that's something that I've always enjoyed and so I'm always I enjoy looking at magazines with beautiful rooms and I you know I accepted at some point that I'm not going to live in a house like that that's okay with me but I just notice things that I like and I have my style I don't necessarily go out purposely changing things but everything always wears out eventually and when it wears out I buy something that meets the need and is in whatever the current style is and that's just kind of how it goes sometimes I get tired of stuff like 
I bought new dishes a couple months ago because I just felt tired of the old ones and so I bought some new ones and they're pretty and I like them so I have no trouble doing things like that but I don't um, it's like not a goal for me to like redecorate every few years to keep up with the trends I just when something needs replaced then I replace it with some pretty new thing that's in whatever the current style is and feel happy about it how do you cut corners or cut costs without losing quality I think that always comes just with experience I don't know that there's anything in particular I can say like that would be helpful to you other than that you just have to try it and see what happens like macaroni and cheese is one thing I will give as an example I've tried buying generic macaroni and cheese instead of craft macaroni and cheese and then I eat the generic macaroni and cheese and I think yuck I don't want to eat this I like the craft kind so I don't cut that corner because I really like the craft and so it's a waste of money for me to buy something that I'm not going to eat so in that instance I would stick with the name brand but there are plenty of things that I buy an off-brand that is perfectly fine and so then it makes no sense to buy the expensive one when the off-brand one works just as well but that's obviously all comes down to personal taste and just going ahead and trying the store brand or whatever it is and then if you don't like it don't keep buying it because if nobody likes it then that just doesn't make any sense but if they do then great you have a way of saving some money all right we've made it to the last question how do you splurge or waste money and I guess I don't know like I just buy what I need when I need it I have no trouble whatsoever if I feel like I need something if I need a new pair of shoes or um, a new lipstick or I want to buy a treat for myself I have absolutely no guilt whatsoever about doing that and I guess because I have no guilt I don't feel like I'm missing out or that I need to so I don't necessarily do it that much but it's not because I can't it's just that I don't have the need to so I I don't know that I would I never think to myself I'm gonna splurge on this I just I get it if I want it and I don't get it if I don't want it and it's the same idea I just used the phrase wasting money a minute ago but I don't we don't really think of money in a way that it can be wasted either if I buy something that it turns out we don't need well I still helped the person who made it <laughs> like I still gave value to their life because they were able to buy groceries because I bought that product from them and so that money didn't go to waste it helped someone and if I make a mistake I think this is something I used to deal with in the past if I bought something and it turned out it was the wrong thing or we didn't like it or I could have got a better deal I would feel guilty about it and I let go of that because it's such a burden like no one's perfect that's just silliness to like feel bad about spending money when you could have done something better like it's okay you just I just move on I think oh yeah that would have been a better deal oh well and I don't even think anything about it I try not to live my life with constantly judging myself it's taken me a long time to get here but it's a burden some way to live and I don't want to live that way so when we get stuff that might be viewed as a waste we don't view it that way it's just it is what it is if there's something we enjoy that might be viewed as a splurge well the whole point of having money is to meet your needs and to live your life and I don't think that the fact that God made food to taste good and other things to be pleasurable means that he wants us to enjoy life and so if I buy something that makes life enjoyable but it's not a definite need item that's okay too I have no problem with that as long as we actually have the money for it it would be different if we were buying things that we couldn't afford that we didn't have the money for but as long as we have money for it and we're being generous we're paying our bills we're we you know got a pantry full of food we have everything we need I have no guilt whatsoever about buying things that I desire and I guess it's just um, it's just living within your means and when you're living within your means you don't have to feel guilty about anything it's it's not a splurge just life okay so there is the end of this very long video I appreciate all of you guys who stuck with me through this whole long thing 
I hope that you have a great day. If you haven't subscribed, I hope that you will consider doing that. And for all of you who already are old friends, I enjoyed spending this time with you today. I will talk to you again very soon.